would open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, and join with me as we pray for our time in Bible study. Father, we are thankful that though we are limited in our ability to fully minister here in the sanctuary, that you have it all under control, Lord, that uh, this vast, wide world internet is yours, and it's at your disposal. And we pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would be uh, reminding us, Lord, of your power and your presence no matter where we are. And we're grateful, Lord, to be able to hear from you in our living rooms or wherever we may be. And we pray, Lord, that soon and very soon that we would all be gathered together. Uh, most of all, Lord, I pray that we would all be gathered together in the clouds, uh, that we'd be caught up to you, uh, that these would be the last of the last days, Lord, that when that last one who will be saved is saved, that we can be gathered to you uh, in that great marriage feast of the Lamb. And we long for that day. We look forward to it, and we pray that you will continue to prepare our hearts for it. But in the meantime, Lord, uh, Father, we pray for your encouragement and your power to do what we can while we can, while we remain here on earth. And Father, we thank you for those that have been so generous to your church in these days. We thank you, Lord, for those who have remained faithful to you during these days. And we pray, Lord, for a great sense of encouragement and power and strength to come from your word today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, the setup for the book of Galatians, Paul is arguing quite strenuously, I might add, for the death of the flesh through life in Christ Jesus. And he uses himself as an example. In fact, in today's study, if you would look at verse 20, he says this, I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's a marvelous statement. I think it's probably one of the greatest verses in all of God's Word. It rolls off of the tongue so easily. Uh, it's very poetic in its authorship, is it not? Um, the question is, how deep does it go and how long does it last in terms of what Paul speaks of here? Because this is the ultimate depiction of Christian living, is it not? In the first case, we see that me, myself, and I no longer live. And what he means by that, it's not that physical life has ended. It's that me, myself, and I no longer rule in this life. And secondly, Christ lives in me where me, myself, and I once did. And this comes, as we will learn and as we are learning, by a, what I would call a reckoned reality, referring back to what Paul declared in Romans chapter 6. This comes by a reckoned reality that can and does fail from time to time, admittedly, but is no excuse, especially for those who should know better and, in fact, do know better. Take Peter, for example, where we pick up our study this morning. In verse 11 of Galatians chapter 2, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Antioch is in Syria, down from Jerusalem, and a great church had been founded there. And Peter had come down from Jerusalem to visit that church and, and to lend his authority to that church and, and his sort of, you know, authorship, his sort of authentication on that church, patting them on the back, um, encouraging them to go for it. But when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, or from Jerusalem, from the, the mother church, so to speak, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Now, one of the things that we see through this passage that I think it's very important for us to see and to recognize fully is that outside influences can and will negate inner power if and when we allow them to. Peter had the power of God working in his life in very profound ways. Just a, a sort of brief little tour through the book of Acts reveals that to us. You don't need to turn with me. I'll just kind of synopsize some of the events that transpired in, in Peter's life as he began to walk with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we recognize in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, it declares to us that, that at the conclusion of Peter's first sermon, in which all of a sudden he became marvelously a great Bible expositor and an evangelist, 
it tells us that those who gladly received his word, Peter's word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Great power flowing through the ministry of the apostle Peter, no doubt. In Acts chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, Peter and John were going up to the temple, and they saw a man who was paralyzed, and Peter said, silver and gold, he was begging, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, amazing, miraculous, power, and wonder working power moving through the apostle Peter. Um, a sort of tragic story, a semi-tragic story anyway, in Acts chapter 5, we see that, that Peter understood that a man by the name of Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit about the donation that he was offering to the church, that he had held back some from himself, but claimed he was giving it all. And Peter said, Ananias, you know, you're going to fall down dead. You're not lying to me. You're not lying to men. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. Peter perceived that. And Ananias fell down dead. And then he said the same thing to Ananias' wife, Sapphira, and she also fell down dead. A couple hours later, amazing power moving through the apostle Peter's life. In Acts chapter 9, in verse 34, it, it tells us, <laughs> amazingly, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you, arise and make your bed, and he rose immediately. And this was a man who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter raised him up, and he was able to walk. And then even more than that, in Acts chapter 9, in verse 40, we read uh, about a woman by the name of Tabitha or Dorcas, as you may be familiar with the story. Peter put them all out. He went into this room where she lay dead, knelt down and prayed, and, and turning, in, turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And then Peter, as he ventured on into Joppa, staying in the house of a man named Simon, it tells us the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray, this is Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And we understand the dietary restrictions that were imposed upon the Jewish people that they would be identifiable to all the cultures on the face of the earth, not so much by what they did eat, but by what they did not eat. And so Peter reviled at the idea that that very phrase is sort of an incongruent phrase, not so Lord, if you really think about it. He's not your Lord whenever you say not so to him. Nonetheless, we know Peter and Peter said, not so, Lord, in a sense, declaring his own righteousness, his own desire for righteousness, his own desire for purity, especially in the eyes of God, um, perhaps perceiving this to be some sort of trick. But uh, the Lord responded to him, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was a picture for Peter about what was to take place on the next day of his life. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven Again, and then in Acts chapter 10, verse 24, as the story continues, we understand that, that Cornelius, a centurion, a Gentile, had sent servants to Peter at Simon the Tanner's house that, that he had also seen in a dream to do that, in a vision to do that. The Lord had instructed him that he might be saved, that he and his whole household might be saved. And so this would have been a galling thing for Peter to do. This would have been a very uncomfortable thing for Peter to do, being invited into a Gentile's home and then actually going into a Gentile's home. That was the necessity of that, that vision uh, brought before him, that he would see those unclean animals bound up in that sheet. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Eat that which you have previously thought to be unclean. What God has made clean, let you not call unclean. So the following day, Peter went with them because the Lord instructed him, hey, there's, there's guys at the door right now. Go with those guys. Do what they ask of you. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together together 
his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in. For a Jew, for somebody of a Jewish background to go into a Gentile's house, this would have been a very difficult challenge to his flesh. Uh, he, He would have really struggled with that. And he admits that. As he talked with them, he went in and found many who had come together. All, he's, he finds himself a Jewish believer surrounded by a, by a whole household of, of Gentiles. And then he said to them, it's not a very friendly thing that he says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. You know how com- uncomfortable it is. You know how unlawful it is for me to be here in this house with you. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Not a very welcoming statement, even as he is being welcomed. It's off-putting to him. You can just imagine the the struggle that's going on in his flesh, even as he does this. And Peter actually took witnesses along with him so that he would not be alone in this challenge so that they could see what God did through this occasion. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation, Gentiles, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. At Antioch, going back to our story here in Galatians chapter 2, at Antioch, Peter was living that life, the life that's just been declared, the life that he declared previous to his visit to Antioch as he visited the home of Cornelius. He was living that life until, as we see in verse 12, until, until what? Until certain men, Jewish believers, came down from Jerusalem, and suddenly Peter permitted their outside influence, another way of expressing that is the the power of their peer pressure, their mere presence to rule in his life rather than the power of Christ. And if it could happen to Peter, and this is the importance of this study, if it could happen to Peter, it could happen to anyone. If we think about everything that Peter has already experienced and expressed in his life, the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, the the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Spirit, he's lived an amazing life Christian life so far. But if it could happen to Peter, this sort of step back, I'm not going to call it backsliding, but definitely a step back into regarding the presence of men. The mere presence of of Jewish believers changed his whole um, operation, changed his whole modus operandi as it is expressed to us here. And then it happened to Barnabas as well. Barnabas. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, verse 13 says, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Barnabas? The son of encouragement? Oh, we remember Barnabas, what a, what a great man of faith he was. The, the little story that is told to us in Acts chapter 9, after Paul had been saved, after Paul had begun ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul came up to Jerusalem. It tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, and when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. After all, he had been the guy that was persecuting them. He had been the guy that was terrorizing them. He had been the guy that was putting them to death and dragging them out of their homes and throwing them into jail. But, verse 37, Acts chapter 9, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. The apostles were afraid of him. Barnabas, man of great faith, son of encouragement, a great helpful man. He brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, Paul that is, Saul, and that he had spoken to him, the Lord had spoken to Saul, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Could this, could this Barnabas, who reacts right along with Peter, stepping away from the Jew, Jewish, or stepping away to the Jewish believers from the Gentiles in this setting at Antioch, could this possibly be the same man? 
And we see the incredulity in Paul's voice as we read these words. They jump off the page to us. Even Barnabas, my close friend and associate, the one who vouched for me, when as far as everyone was concerned, I was an unreliable imposter, Barnabas stood for me in the presence of these very Jewish believers and the apostles. And this passage, the reason that Galatians chapter 2 is so very, very important is this passage gives us a glimpse of where we might be today if it were not for the Apostle Paul. And we are very much indebted to the Apostle Paul because Paul zealously fought for and guarded the gospel of grace. In fact, looking ahead, he declares in verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And this point cannot be overemphasized. It's a very powerful ministry point. It's sort of the central theme of all of Paul's ministry is the grace of God and nothing being added to the grace of God. And this cannot be overemphasized, if I can even say it. We must never allow ourselves to fall back into a pattern of self-approval or self-preservation according to any external rule, even the law of God. You see, the law of God has no power to reform us, never has, never will, but only to convict and to reveal to us by that conviction that reform is required that we may be saved by grace. See, the law of God is designed to to move us along, move along toward grace. And Paul knew this as well or better than anyone. Again, it's the book of Acts in chapter 22. Paul sort of briefly summarizing his life in his trial before the Jews, declaring of himself, In verse 3 of Acts chapter 22, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, speaking of Jerusalem, taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. Now, Peter was a Jew who became a follower of Christ, but he was sort of a a run-of-the-mill Jew, if you forgive the expression. He was sort of a a Jewish believer who was primarily a fisherman from the Galilee region, along with most of the other apostles. They were not theologians. They had not been raised as theologians, studying the Word of God as Paul had. So if Peter was a Jew, well, Paul even more so. He was a Jew of Jews as he presents himself. And he studied at the feet of one of the greatest of all the Jewish scholars, a man by the name of Gamaliel, and he knew Jewish law inside and out, and and at one point in his life, and what he's sharing that with us to mean is that at one point in his life, he was so bound up in that law, and it was that law that made him so zealous that he crucified Christians for the sake of that law. He was there when Stephen was stoned, the first martyr for Jesus Christ. He was present. And he thought himself righteous according to the law for being there and for doing so. You see, Paul knew about the law as well or better than anyone. And we might say, thinking to ourselves, or thinking out loud, or thinking along with the Apostle Paul, who cares? if doing what Peter did was pleasing to the visiting Jewish believers. Do you care what people think about you in regards to the purity of your relationship and your walk with Jesus Christ according to the grace of God? Do you care? Who cares if it made Peter feel better or, in this case, perhaps even safer? What Peter did was wrong, And thank God, Paul allowed the Holy Spirit alive in him to call him on it and allow the Holy Spirit alive in Peter to convict him of it. Peter knew it was wrong. Turn back with me to Acts chapter 11. 
after Peter had been to Cornelius' house, after the Holy Spirit had fallen upon all of those who were gathered at Cornelius' house, after those who were of Cornelius' house had been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, Peter faced the daunting task of going back up to Jerusalem and trying to explain that to all the Jewish believers because before that there were no such thing as anything other than Jewish believers. And so he had the daunting task, and, and fortunately he had witnesses it wasn't just his word. Fortunately, he had witnesses that came with him back up to Jerusalem where he explained to them what took place in Cornelius' household. And so we, we read, beginning in Acts chapter 11, verse 1, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And that would have been shocking to them. And even if they knew Jesus' teaching, and even if they understood that Jesus was reaching out to touch the whole world, and indeed they probably did in a mental way, but still emotionally and viscerally, the idea of Gentiles who they previously had been raised to think were nothing but dogs, a lower form of humanity, if you will, extremely prejudiced against who they were and what they were and how they were, the fact that God would now open the gates to the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles would have been shocking to them, even if they knew that that, that should be true, according to what Jesus has said. For God so loved the whole world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the whole world. He sent his only begotten son to that whole world that whoever believes in him Whoever believes in the Father through the Son in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that applies to everyone. And, and we might even struggle with that today. And hopefully there are certain politicians that you might rage against that you would actually be praying for their salvation because that would provide the solution to the problem that we face with the way that they're acting presently. And so rather than, than condemning them or praying against them, we should, in fact, be praying for their salvation, even though viscerally we oppose them, sometimes even to the point of hatred or anger. That should be an alarm bell going off to remind us to pray for them, no matter who they are and no matter which side of the political spectrum you rest on. But I can imagine how they felt there in Acts chapter 11, verse 1. And so those of the circumcision contended with him, Jewish believers. They contended with Peter, the apostle Peter. Saying, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Exclamation point. Peter's, man, he's in trouble here, if this is allowed to stand. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I, I, I would... I, I'm right with you guys. I, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance and I, I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, as we read earlier in, in Acts chapter 10, let down from heaven by four corners and it came to me. And when I observed it intently and considered, I, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, very honestly, hey, I identify with you guys. I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, and these are red letters. This is Jesus' voice. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea, then the Spirit told me to go, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered a man's house. And again, put yourself in Peter's place. He's never stepped foot in a Gentile's house his entire life. This is not easy for his flesh. This is a difficult challenge for him. It's a struggle. So when they entered the Gentile's house, he, Cornelius, told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. And that's a pretty miraculous thing, is it not? Who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, 
The Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If, therefore, God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? It's a good question, isn't it? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, that is, the listeners, to what Peter is presenting to them about what has taken place in his life, that Gentiles have indeed been born again, that Gentiles have indeed received the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when they heard these things, the Jewish believers, at Jerusalem, they became silent. That's amazing. I can't believe that God would save Gentiles too even though Jesus said he would, but actually hearing about it, actually seeing it, actually hearing the story of it, ah, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And that's amazing, isn't it? And so we go back to Galatians chapter 2, reminding ourselves that Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles, he was eating with the Gentiles until certain Jewish believers came down from Jerusalem and immediately when he saw them, he stepped away from the Gentiles, went over to the Jewish believers and acted as if he had never been hanging out with the Gentiles. That he had set aside all of the power of God in his life, in his heart, in his mind, in his way, in his manner, and gone back, taken a step back, influenced by legalism, influenced by the external presence, uh, the, the, peer pre the implied peer presence, the mere presence of these Jewish believers changed his whole demeanor, changed his whole way of thinking, changed his whole way of living. Paul called him on it. The Holy Spirit in Paul, imagine those that were questioning the authority of Paul's apostleship. That seems to be something that he's struggling with throughout each of the epistles that he writes to the churches that he planted. And here he's writing to a whole region of churches, and, and obviously the, the Jewish believers have followed him everywhere he goes, challenging his apostleship, probably the churches in Galatia, no different. And, and here he forthrightly tells them, hey, the apostle Peter, who was in certain circles, even today, regarded as, as what? The first pope? And, and certainly one of the most, if not the most eminent apostles that there could be such a thing, although God does not regard the person of men, but nonetheless how we choose to think about things, that Paul actually withstood him to his face in the presence of all of these people there at the church in Antioch. But when I saw they were not straightforward about what? About the truth of the gospel... I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews as he just was prior to them arriving, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews and that's what you're doing by stepping away from them and now associating yourself only with the Jews? There's an implication there. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. No flesh can be, no flesh will be, no flesh shall be, justified by the works of the law. It just isn't possible, and we know that. Peter, you know that. I know that. We know that better than anyone. That's why Jesus came. And now you've gone back. And Paul has stood him to his face publicly. Imagine doing that. I mean, you can think of some pretty important figures in the, in the evangelical church today, can't you? I mean, we could, we could throw out a list of names, um, and it's, you know, it's really wonderful that certain men have a, a 
sort of a, a broadcast ministry, a, a ministry that speaks to, to thousands, if not millions of people. Could you imagine one of those who we regarded to be great evangelical figures? Could you imagine one of those great evangelical figures visiting our church? And could you imagine how full this church would be if one of those great evangelical figures, of which we could name but will remain nameless, visited our church? And could you imagine that great evangelical figure in his own humanity saying something not quite right according to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And could you imagine further you standing up in the middle of that huge crowd that's come to see that great evangelical figure and withstanding them to their face and telling them what they've said wrong? That's what, that's what Paul, this, in, in a sense, this pipsqueak. Now, we, know, we think of him as a great man. But he was challenged everywhere he went, especially in the authority of his apostleship. And here he is standing up to Peter in front of all these witnesses. We know that the, the church at Antioch had exploded, and it was primarily filled with Gentiles. And Paul, recognizing the importance of this being made right and this not being allowed to stand, withstood him to his face. No flesh can be, will be, or shall be ever justified by the works of the law. And we think to ourselves, what if the church, thinking of the church as an entity for a moment, what if the church had permitted external performance to coexist along with the doctrine of grace? Well, the answer is we'd have a church that resembles most of the world's churches today, filled with carnality and or works-based sacrament-keeping righteousness. You ever been a part of a church like that? I have. And I was, I was in a sort of a mainline denomination. You, you venture into the, the Roman church and now you've, you've actually got works added to the gospel full on as a means of, of earning your way into a <laughs> partial salvation in, in regards to, to purgatory, the, the presentation of that, and the indulgences and all that, these things are unbiblical. And Paul would withstand them to their face. After all, thinking of in that Roman church, they, they cast their lineage all the way back to the apostle Peter and his infallibility, but certainly he proves himself to be a fallible man even on this occasion that we're studying here today. We'd have a church that resembles most of the world's churches today, filled with carnality and or works-based sacrament-keeping righteousness, to which God said in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Oh, you know the verse, don't you? In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah said, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. That's, that's the best you can do according to works in God's eyes. That's what God said through the prophet Isaiah. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, about these very kinds of things. In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 7, when he was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. And what he's describing there in our day, as in his soon-to-be following after his day, um, the emanation of the church, the dissemination of the church, they got it wrong right from the beginning. Now, thankfully, there was a pure remnant that remained through the course of history as well, but for the broad church, they became the broad way, coupling works-based salvation with the gospel somehow, some way, depending on which denomination you chose to follow. It's all in there. It's enfolded in all of it. The flesh seeking to accomplish righteousness through works. And Jesus says that's the broad way that leads to destruction. Why? Because righteousness cannot be established by the keeping of the law. It can't be. It never will be. And no flesh will ever be justified by keeping the law. You've already broken so much of it before you even come to an understanding of the law that there's no way that you can reconcile that. Jesus goes on to say, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, 
and there are a few who find it. And the difficulty that he speaks of there is at least the difficulty that we have wrestling with our own flesh in its desire to be righteous before God, to keep the rules, to think ourselves more righteous when we prayed for an hour than we do when we prayed 10 minutes. Or to think of ourselves more righteous when we've gone out there and we've clothed the naked and fed the hungry than we would be if we stayed at home. All these kinds of things all tied up, all wrapped up in our flesh that we struggle against. We understand that intuitively, intrinsically. It's why this passage in Galatians chapter 2 is so important. And then further, in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, Jesus declared this in chapter 2, speaking of the church. And in Revelation chapter 2, he acknowledges the great works going on with, within the confines of a church. And no matter how you apply these messages, these letters that he writes, the seven letters to the seven churches, there are many different examples that we can employ using these letters. But for the sake of today's study, notice this. I know your works, speaking to the church, and they're good works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That's all great. We know that because we've studied this chapter many times over. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. And so they, they need to repent of their idea that their works are accomplishing something in God's eyes that would not have been accomplished had they not done those works. And Jesus admires their works. There is such a thing as something being better than something else, but it is not a means of, of establishing or acquiring righteousness in God's eyes. No, never. Never. And, and he says, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I am not interested, Jesus says, in a works-based doctrine. I am not interested, Jesus says, in a church that represents me by a works-based doctrine. I'll put that lampstand out. And we look out there at the denominational church, and what do we see? Those that are practicing these works-based doctrines in whatever form or fashion they may be, they lack the Holy Spirit. They lack the presence of the Holy Spirit. They lack the power of the Holy Spirit. God does not authenticate. Now, those churches operate. They're, they're wealthy. They're big. They're fancy. They have all the appearances, all the outward trappings of being godly in every way. And God says, yeah, I know your works. I see that. And it's not too late for them to repent, by the way. It's not too late for them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through being born again. It's never too late. And really, the, the manner that Jesus speaks is against the leaders in that church even more than the individuals in those churches. But those, these are strong words that we need to be mindful of, to pay attention to, our first love, our first love. And I know that we think about this in different ways from time to time, and our first love, yes, is Jesus Christ. But the reason that our first love is Jesus Christ is because of our love for the gospel of grace in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we love Jesus. We love him because he first loved us and first gave us of his grace, as demonstrated that we talked about last weekend, the, the grace of his sacrificial work on the cross. Undeserved, unmerited favor. Our love for the gospel of the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Or it isn't love at all. It isn't love at all to be under the burden of trying to please God by keeping a set of external rules. But obviously, and here's the rub, and Paul addresses it, and I'm glad that he did, but obviously Christians, in fact all Christians, myself included, can and do continue to commit sin. Does this make Christ a minister of sin? 
Given everything that we've said so far, Paul says in verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? What an amazing question that is. And I don't know, perhaps reading through this passage um, in advance of coming here today, anticipating that we would cover this ground together, I hope that you have, and I hope that you've had much time to think about, because this little statement here, this, this little theological gem that he presents that we would ponder is not a verse that we should pass over quickly, easily, or readily, but we should stop to think about exactly what Paul is saying here. Because grace is perceived to be not powerful enough to change people's behavior. And Paul recognizes that. After all, what has a greater opportunity to change your behavior? A list of rules? A list of do's and don't do's? Or just saying, walk in the grace of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. By appearance, which of those two has the greater opportunity to reform your behavior? And we think, because we are in these bodies of flesh, just give me a set of rules. Tell me what to do. Jesus was faced with this question. Tell us what to do to do the works of God. Do you remember what Jesus said in John's Gospel? Believe on me, whom God sent. Belief. Belief is, if you want to work, then we're talking about faith. We're talking about belief. Now, the fact that Christians can and do, including myself, including each one of you here in the room today, the fact that Christians, and it's obvious, the fact that all Christians continue to commit sin, does this make Christ, therefore, a minister of of sin? And remembering here for a moment, Paul's speaking to believers, although this message goes beyond that, and it always has down through the centuries of reading through this passage. Paul's speaking to believers, and he says, certainly not. And it's one of those very powerful certainly nots that Paul declares here in Galatians that we see him declaring over and over again because the fault lies not with Christ nor his grace, but in our failure to reckon ourselves dead. And as as I mentioned when we started this message, this is a reckoned reality. We have to reckon it to be so. And, And that's an accounting term. It's not a deep southern term. You know, it, it, to reckon it, to account it to be so, to consider it to be so. We reckon ourselves dead to the punishment of the law and alive to the life of Christ in us, as he says in verse 18, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, imagine, and I love the illustration that Pastor Chuck provides on this point. Imagine that you rob a bank and you get arrested. You don't get away with it. The teller presses a silent alarm. Uh, the ink goes on you when you open the bag. The police run you down. They, they arrest you. They take you to court. You go through the whole procedure. A year later, boom, they pronounce your sentence. For armed robbery of a bank, you're given 10 to 15 in a, in a state penitentiary. While you're on the way to the state penitentiary in the van that's transporting you, you get hit by a semi-tractor trailer, and you get killed. Now, do they take your corpse out of the back of that van, your crushed, broken corpse that is now dead, load it into another vehicle and haul it to the state penitentiary and put your corpse in the jail for 10 to 15 years. Do they do that? No. By death, you have escaped the punishment that was meted out on you correctly by a righteous judge. It is by death that you escape the punishment of sin. And this is what Paul is declaring here. We'll see it next week in chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Speaking of this, this idea, the reckoned reality of our death to the flesh and being made alive in the Spirit. Are you so foolish, you Galatians, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made 
perfect by the flesh. And remember, this is, this is people making a U-turn. This is people considering a U-turn like Peter briefly did when he swerved into a ditch, finding himself under the binding pressure of, of these Jewish believers that were suddenly in his presence. He didn't expect. And worse, there's another possibility and I think probably the great majority of the church lives right here, since I know I can't keep the law. I know enough, I know the Ten Commandments, I know enough of the law, I know enough about the law, since I know I can't keep the law, I may as well break the law, since I know I can receive grace in the end. Because I keep hearing preachers talk about grace, grace, marvelous grace, wonderful grace, the grace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ. And since I know I can't keep the law, I may as well break it, since I know I can receive grace in the end by doing a work of penance. That's what I'll do. I'll just, I'll do what I want to do, but I'll do a work of penance to balance that out. And isn't that what we, what we see with all the Hail Marys and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it is, isn't it? And, and we're seeking forgiveness from, from men bestowing that and, and their prescriptions for how that can be accomplished. And, and that's, a, that's a sort of happy life. That's a sort of considered life that, that even though I did that, I did this to make up for it. Even though I did that, I did this to make up for it. And even though I did that, I did this to make up for it. On and on and on. And this is the pattern of religious behavior. It is wrong. It has always been wrong. And it will always be wrong. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. And the reason that he never knew you is because you made yourself a stranger. You never welcomed me, Jesus would say. You never welcomed me and my lordship in your life. And I want to add the phrase, for your life. The lordship of Jesus Christ that you must invite and you must reckon to be so is the greatest life there is. It's for your benefit. You see, grace, the grace of God extends to a greater degree. It's infinite. It extends to a greater degree than just for the purpose of salvation, although it is in what we would declare to be salvific. If we were studying soteriology, which is the theological study of how it is that a man must be saved, but it also extends into your conduct and how you live your life and being guided and directed as you allow it to be so by no longer being the Lord of your life, by putting your flesh to death, so to speak, by reckoning your flesh dead and allowing Jesus to live through you, which he desires to do. And so Paul begs for this relationship. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. Here's this beautiful verse. Here's this wonderful verse, one of the greatest verses in the history of mankind and especially in God's word. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To add anything to the grace of God, anything, anything, for salvation, or to be righteous is to make Christ's sacrifice for your sin. And this is why Paul argues so strenuously, so zealously, so vehemently, and thank God that he did, because where would we be if we had not had this, this singular man, this remarkable man, stand up for grace in the face of all the pressure to conform ourselves to an external law and an external rule, even the external law of God, to add anything to the grace of God for salvation or to be righteous is to make Christ's sacrifice for your sin incomplete, unnecessary, and Paul uses the word vain, Dorian in the Greek, without a cause, for not, unnecessary. Remember Jesus in the garden praying to his Father who is in heaven, Father, if there be any other means, if, there, if there's any other possible way, let this cup pass from me. Understanding the cup of suffering that was about to be poured out upon him on that very next day. Even to the extent of being separated from his father as he became sin. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And here's the invitation. And this invitation that Paul also authors is to believers and unbelievers alike. Um, Romans chapter 6, declaring very similarly, some of these verses may have been ringing in your mind even as we discuss these things, even as Paul presents the, them to the church at Galatia. 
In Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, Paul says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And and it it explains to us the typology that's being employed in baptism, in water baptism. Lowered beneath the surface of the water, representing our death to ourselves. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. That as we're raised up out of the water, it it bespeaks of a new life, a a born-again life, a life indwelt by the person of Jesus Christ himself, by the Holy Spirit of God. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, here's the phrase, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We now have the opportunity to make a choice. And we can choose the power of God over the depravity of our flesh. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law? Again, raising this question, but under grace? Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of righteousness leading to, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness, and you reckoned that to be so. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Paul writes, for Christ is the end of the law. Can you imagine that? Romans chapter 10, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To who? To everyone who believes. If you're not a believer, then the law is for you. The law is there to show you that you're a sinner, to convict you, to bring you into the opportunity to receive the righteousness of Christ. In verse 9 of Romans chapter 10, Paul writes that if you confess, how do I receive the righteousness of Christ? How do I receive the grace of God fundamentally, functionally? That's, That's worth knowing, is it not? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord. I believe that Jesus is the Lord. He's now the Lord of my life rather than me being the Lord of my life. That's a profound change. That's what we call repentance. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? You will be saved. Well, that didn't take very much, did it? My flesh wants to do something. Doesn't your flesh want to do something? Don't you even feel better about yourself because you came to church today? Don't you even feel better about yourself because you're watching online today? And maybe you even, even though you're in your living room, maybe you even sang along out loud. You get extra credit for that, right? You feel more righteous for doing that, right? You see how we are? In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us this. And if Christ is in you, verse 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, promise, give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray. Father, today as we consider these things that are so very important to our understanding and to our lives as we walk with you and as we desire to learn more and more of you, Father, may we once again remind ourselves of the importance of reckoning ourselves dead. And we pray further for those who may be watching online or maybe are here today in in our presence,
that have never truly considered this possibility before that there is no way of accomplishing righteousness through any sort of adherence to an external standard, even the law of God, which we know is perfect. And Father, I, I pray that you would bring that good, blessed conviction that only comes by the Holy Spirit to all who have heard these words today, and I pray that you would bring them to a deeper understanding and a full understanding of the one and only true basis for our salvation, which is death to the flesh and life in Christ that has been so well expressed here through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And how thankful we are, Lord, that you've given us a church that believes full on in the gospel of grace and in grace alone for salvation. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to stay on this straight and narrow path over time, especially knowing that our flesh is so prone to desire to do pleasing works for you and unto you. And Lord, may it be so in this church and in all those who call this their church home or, or even those who are about to open their hearts and begin new life in Christ, that though we would desire to do good things and, and good works for our fellow man, that the heart of that, the very center of that would be our love for you and your love for us. And rather than us seeking to please you by our works, seeking to earn a standard of righteousness by our works, that they would be an expression of the love that you have for us. And we're thankful, Lord, that you would help us to reckon these things to be so and to understand the importance, once again, of that reckoning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're about to play what we call affectionately a song of invitation. And again, just thinking back to our study last week and what Jesus expressed to the believers that he walked with on the road to Emmaus that he would have passed on had they not invited him to stay with them longer. And it sort of changes the way that we think about what an invitation really is because when an invitation goes out from a stage like this or from behind a pulpit like this, we think about this church is inviting me to receive Jesus Christ or, or Jesus himself is inviting me to receive Jesus Christ for salvation, but that's not really the case, is it? We, our hearts being fully informed about the truth of the gospel of the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ, now are presented with the opportunity to invite him into our hearts. And that's really the invitation. And so we're going to play and sing a song of invitation while you consider these things and while you worship the Lord together with us and while you join your hearts, hopefully, affectionately, lovingly, to the Lord God Almighty, that as we play and as we sing, that you will consider these things deeply. And then at the conclusion of this song, I'm going to give you the opportunity to be born again by praying that Christ would be made alive in your heart. And if you've never taken that step, that is your greatest need today especially facing the perils that this world presents to us in this time. Amen?